My mom picked 300. My grandma picked 300. My aunts and they picked 300. Well, really, wasn't a whole lot to do back then, but it kind of always happened. So you never really got far ahead. It, it, it wasn't worth it. He wasn't, he wasn't accomplishing nothing. Go get your cotton picking clothes on. I had a nice place to stay, and I had food. A lot of family togetherness. Well, we did it when I first remember it was um, my my family, my dad and my mom and my brother in one house, and then my uncle and his wife down further, and my grandparents, my dad's parents up above. We called that the high house. He was the main, you know, Papa was the main one, and we lived there for years and years and years. He bought the farm, I believe, in 1936, and I think he told me he paid $2 an acre. He bought 200 acres at the time. It was really a self-sustaining farm. We picked out in Redditch. We picked out in Boston, and the Alvin Madison. Then, then the Springfield, we picked out down there. And there. And then to Old Bell Grove, we pick cotton in there. See, I picked cotton, cotton for Mr. Shepherd first. Mr. Um, Bunny Shepherd, he's staying really. His wife's name is Ellie. And then we come on down to Mr. Shorty Whitaker. He's staying really too. Him and my, my Bessie. That's what I used to call her, Mama Bessie. He lived on their property. We um, worked their land. He could have been called a tenant farmer. We moved out here in 49, and we was on the Godfrey farm. You know, we lived in the tenant house. We didn't own any house or anything. And then if you was living in the house in the farm, then you went out and picked cotton. Once we got used to it, it wasn't any problem because we was obedient to our parents and did what they told us, you know. So they said, let's go to the field, we get up and get ready and go mm -hmm. It was just a way of living. It just was something natural. I was assigned the job of watching my two, three younger siblings. I would pick a little bit nearby and then go check on the babies. They were on a pallet at the end of the row under some shade trees. They, they stayed in that area while the older ones, we picked cotton. I would just pick a short ways and then it was my duty to go check on them, make sure ants weren't crawling on them or biting on them or whatever. Or they weren't eating mud. Uh, but I do remember one day, Bobby was asleep and a fly climbed into his nose and I never saw it come out. Well, sometime they would catch you and them when they were real small, you know, just keep them out of the house and getting in the thing. And uh, we'd go out in the field and, and, and they'd put you on the spray for to put the cotton on. And we'd sit there and they'd have water and some for us eat, you know. I remember though at one point when, when I was the baby and the daddy made me a little tent out of, made me a little house out of poker sacks and I would play around in that little house while he and mom would stop and visit with me and play a little bit with me and then they'd go on and pick more cotton. When I was eight years old, but I had, you know, I've been to the country before then, Mama used to take me to the country and let me sit on the cotton pile. Mm -hmm. Some days, I, I'd take me a nap on her cotton pile. She would uh, fix my food, fix me, you know, water and stuff. And if I didn't uh, sit on her cotton pile, she'd put me up, she'd put me up on the shade tree, and, you know, just why I'd be comfortable while she picking 
kind of, and then when you know they um pick so far, she'll come in and, and get me and move me to an, another spot. And then as I got a little bit older, she um she made me a little sack so I could pick me some cotton. And I I I, I loved that. Now, see, I thought I was doing something, cause see, I saw her with that, and I said, "Ooh, Mama, me and you got the same thing," and she just laughed. I started actually started going out because I didn't want to be home by myself. Because when I get home from school, most of the time I'd be by myself. We was out in the country. Houses wasn't too close, and sometimes I go out there just to be with the other kids. Probably six or seven years old. My brothers and sisters were there too. And I was around six, seven years old. We were trying to make a decent living, and it was uh, my, my parents' idea to go out and help make a living, you know. Then children had to work, so we'd go out there in the cotton field and help them pick cotton. Well, I was about six, and when I started, we just picked our cotton and put it in the, my mama's sack until, you know, I got big enough for us to have my own sack. I was, I was six years old when I, you know, went with the field. Because your grandma and mama didn't have nobody to leave us with, so she had taken us to be with her. It was three of us, so she put it all three on the, on the road together. And, and, uh, and we picked, and, you know, she made sure she kept us, you know, up with her by helping us pick you up with our road. But it was, it was a small sack, like a, you know, a small flower sack. And then she put the straps on the sack for the go over. Like a pocketbook, you know, with the straps on it. But uh, you put it over your head and then it hang down. Our pick sacks, you know, were made out of made out of uh, like flower sacks or those those kind of sacks. And ours just kind of fit just kind of fit to the ground. Just kind of fit to the ground. Right, the pick sack is over on your right side. You pick cotton with both hands. And then put it in one hand, put it in the side. I'd get me a row of cotton and go down that row of cotton. Sometimes we'd carry two rows. We'd carry one on this side and we'd carry one on this side. Carry them both together. Sometimes you get on your knees because if, if, if uh, that sack gets heavy and you're hurting your back, you have to take a little pressure off of you, then you get down on your knees. A lot of people picked on their knees. Are you, there are some spots where you, know, you, you might even get down on your knees, you know, because you're, you're bending over. But. We kids, we would put on the toughest old pants that we had, some worn out jeans or something of that sort, and kind of crawl along the ground and pull it like that. And a lot of cotton pickers wore knee pads. We had an old tire. Back then you didn't have steel radials. They were just all rubber, and uh, they would cut those and... Uh, maybe make holes in it and put some ties with rags around it or string. My mother made those out of guana sack. That was the best fertilizer back then. My dad would go to some big wholesale place or uh, warehouse and buy guana by the ton, but it came in bags. They were heavy cotton bags and then my, after they were used my mother would rip those seams open and put four of them together and make a cotton sheet. And back in them days they had a, a sheet you know you spread the sheet out and as you pick the cotton you empty cotton on the sheet as, and we call that our cotton pile. Each one of us had a cotton pile. You know um it was a lot of, you know, out there in the field, but everybody know what a cotton pile was. Daddy had a big sheet that when our pick sacks got full, we would dump it on that sheet. And at the end of the day, he would weigh the sheet to see how much we had, we had all picked to, you know, together that day. And we have a location out there where 
uh, we had a, the uh, sheets. And then when rain uptime come, then everybody would gather around their own sheet to see how much cotton they had done picked up, you know, when they weighed it up. Sometime it would be the family sheet, and sometime it would be your end. If you could pick enough cotton like I could, uh, they'd give you your own sheet, see. But now if you wasn't going to pick about 40, 50 pounds, <laughs> they wouldn't give you your own sheet. Uh, at the end of the day, or uh, when we said, that uh, sheet's full enough, let's tie it up. All right, you'd get uh, at least two people would get the corners of them. Do this, they tie this in, then they tie this, stick the cotton over in there. They tie it like that. Then they stick that scale out there, pull it up. See? I always liked the time when we weighed the cotton. And we had this big, long stick, this big, long thing about that big around. And then he would, he would somebody would put it on one shoulder and somebody would put it on another shoulder. We had steelyards, steel yard, S-T-E-E-L-Y-A-R-D, -E -E and it was a metal pole, and we have one somewhere on the farm, uh, and it had this big weight on it, and you would, it had two hooks, a hook that you'd hook to the lift pole. They had a long, heavy-duty pole that two men usually would lift it up, had one hook in the uh, sheet of cotton and one on the pole. Then you'd lift it up, and my daddy was always the one to weigh it. He'd push that uh, ball, the PEA, P -E -A, uh, on the steel. You slid it out until it balanced, and you knew that it might be 90 pounds or 220 pounds. And then the wagon would pick up the sheets of cotton. And then when that wagon got full, uh, it would go to the cotton gin. After they weighed up everybody, and everybody knows what the, the amount was that they had picked that day, then they loaded up and carried put it in the barn. Eh? And uh, I was fortunate enough to pick three or 400 pounds of cotton a day. You know, I started off you know, with 100 pounds. And I went on up, on the fields, I got 300. And that's what I picked every day. My mom picked 300. My grandma picked 300. My aunt's thing, they picked 300. He'd pay like maybe $3 a hundred, or $3.50 a hundred, something like that. They don't give you but three or four dollars, but you think you got something. You be done pick cotton all the week. But that's all you get, three or four dollars. Well, I was brought up, I shared with my mama. I let her give me what, what she want to give me. Now, occasionally, you know, on Saturday, you know, if we were going to go to town, we might get a nickel and a dime to buy some penny candy or something, but it was a family affair, and it really was. We all worked together. Well, we would see the what my dad called the hands getting paid and it was like we'd kind of kid we need to be paid too and he says yeah i'm gonna pay you no attention until you get to the supper table she let her, she let her draw her own pay and it being when we we'll get our own pay then she said y'all want to give you some it's all right if you don't it's all right so we all gave her some money so she told me I had to give that much because my sister and brother didn't make that much. But still, I gave her, you know, I gave her a good bit of money because she was taking care of us. She was feeding us, you know, clothing us. And so I gave her most of my money. Uh, Saturday, that's when the most was paid off on Saturday. And the farm that we worked on, you out picking cotton, uh, there was a man that looked over the women and children, and then they had one over the grown men. The only way that you know that you wasn't going to work after lunch, if you rang that bell once or twice, that means you could get your clothes off and go to the little town over there in Newburn where you buy your groceries and stuff. But uh, unless, if, now if you rang that bell several times, that means come on back to the field and get that cotton sack and go back to pick the cotton.
they call it a crop bed. Except for instance, if he got, I didn't say 20 bales of cotton off that part where he had. Part of it went to Mr. Mason, and the other part was his one. They called it self mint. See, I mentioned that this over downtown in Madison, uh, where we they used to go down there to his office, and that's where they would have these self mints in the year. We'll see, I would give them what he thought they earned, which wouldn't be very much. But that's just what he liked for them. Yeah, and that's why he would go and borrow money, you know, he borrowed money to make just for his family to survive for that week. And that's what, as I got older, I didn't like. You know, as I got older and went to school and got school and understood, it, it, it wasn't worth it. Cause he wasn't, he wasn't accomplishing nothing. That's why I said they have a settlement. And see, all he done borrowed, he had to pay it back. So when he ended up, he wasn't claiming nothing. Not much. He came out in debt, yes. You just about like a sack of kept you in a bind all the time, just about. But I tell you, we, we was fortunate to work with some good people. But everybody wasn't good out right there. <laughs> they take everything that you could make, I tell you. Well, we had a, I would say a hard life, but it wasn't hard because, see, that, that's all I know to do. It was a good life, but it was, it was hard. But it was good. I see that it was hard work. Yes, and and uh, when you look back on it, you'll say, well, that's the way we had to make our living to take care of our families and things. So you just said, well, the Lord bless us to get out of the cotton field and start something else. His dream, his dream was one day he was going to be driving one of those big old trucks down the road and he was not going to be picking cotton. He was going to be driving that big old truck down the road. And, uh, and I said, you know, one of these days, I'm not going to be picking cotton. I'm going to be gone to Atlanta or somewhere else. Until I graduated from high school, I was 17. And the next day, I caught trailways to Atlanta to get me a job. I took out about 17 years old. You know how... Little young girls back in there, they figured that they didn't have to pick no cotton. So I went and got me a little old house job. Mm -hmm. I was making $25 a week. When we got where we could buy a little spot of land or something like that and get your own dwelling place, that really was the key.